So, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, our C seminar. My name is Randy Phillip. I'm the um, I'm a professor at San Diego State, and I'm the director of the Center for Research in Math and Science Education. And we're really delighted to have you here tonight, and we're excited about our speaker. Um, I'm going to ask Penny Adler, who's one of our our slides are doing what they want to do and not what I want them to do. <laughs> she's one of our editorial committee members and she's going to say a few words of welcome to you tonight. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, my role as chair of the uh, education committee for the League of Women Voters and for the last, I don't know how many years, five or whatever, we have had the pleasure of working with San Diego State in the Crimsey program um, doing these joint programs. We do one in the fall and then sometimes we do one in the spring. And what's exciting is they're always sort of the up and coming. We did some on Common Core. Uh, this one obviously is on the Maker Lab that I didn't know a lot about. So for me it was really interesting to learn about it. And one of the things that uh, to me is wonderful is having the opportunity to walk around and learn about all these exciting programs because I always find that there's so many exciting things going on and half the time you don't know about half of them. And like here you learn about it and go, oh wow, that's something that's really neat that I can incorporate or use or learn from. So this is very exciting and I, I know I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, unfortunately the list is up. <laughs> these are our uh, seminar editorial committee. Um, C stands for STEM Education, Economics and Equity. And the group was started many years ago. Um, and as I say, we've the league and the state and other organizations, we've been uh, very pleased that we could work together to bring these to you and hope that this one will be one and you'll look to coming to others in the future. So thank you again. We're looking forward to our speaker and potentially more opportunity to explore some of the uh, programs. Thank you, Penny. So, um, a couple of thank yous that we want to uh, make tonight. Um, the first one is to this lovely um, room and to uh, the San Diego Gas and Electric Energy Innovation Center. And uh, Russell, are you in the room? So Russell uh, Lab, we want to thank him for helping make this happen and he would like to welcome you on behalf of um, SDG and &E. Thanks Randy. So, Hello everyone, I'm Russell Law with San Diego Gas and Electric. Quick question, who has been here before? All right, a good number of hands. So thank you guys for coming back, and to those whose first time is here, thank you guys for coming. Uh, I like your group because you guys have already walked around and touched everything, so <laughs> you're not shy, which is really nice too. Uh, just a little bit about this building, which is really neat. We are one of 10 buildings in the entire world to be double lead platinum. So that really just shows our commitment to energy efficiency and the environment. And you guys probably drove in and saw the cool solar trees as they you know, attract the sun, or you guys might have come in late and there's no more sun. But uh, we want you guys to really look around, um, see what you guys can do for your houses, your businesses, your communities. We offer a lot of free classes if you're interested for businesses and for your house. So really this is a building about education and resources for ways to reduce your energy use and improve the communities. Um, I guess I have to do a little bit of housekeeping in case you guys have to go to the bathroom. Down the halls and on your left there's also a water fountain there but there's great drink selection up here too. Uh, in the case of an emergency, we'll meet out front and make sure everyone's accounted for. And as you guys finish up the food, which is delicious, please just make sure it goes into the appropriate bins. We are one of the county of San Diego, city of San Diego's largest um, land composting partners, and so that helps us with that. So thank you guys again, and uh, I'm excited, and I hope you guys are too. <coughs> thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank Karen Palmer for um, all of her work in making this possible, including making sure the food was out, the um, exhibitors knew where to come. Um, so thank you, Karen, for, um, for that. Um, I'd like to thank Haley, would you like to wave when you're not taking photos? And Linda, 
Where's is Linda? Be oh, she's still mining the, the the name tags. And Ray, who's in the back videotaping, they are um, doctoral students in the joint program between SDSU and UCSD. And when they're not thinking big thoughts, they're helping us in all kinds of important ways. So thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the C Seminar Editorial Committee. Is there anybody else from the Editorial Committee here tonight besides Penny? Well, they've been. Um, we have meetings when we set up, make decisions about who we're going to invite, and we decided this year that we wanted to bring in someone from the Maker Movement, and uh, so um, they helped us make these decisions, and we appreciate that. Um, we have some sponsors. I'll share with you in just a minute. Um, Special thanks to all the exhibitors. How about a round, a round of applause? Uh, that was really, really interesting to get, to, to get to talk to them and see what they were doing. And, of course, our speaker, Jessica Parker, who will be introduced in just a minute by Donna. Um, so this is the uh, editorial committee, and um, I need to sort of shout out to Barbara Edwards, who couldn't make it tonight, but Barbara was on our committee for many years. And she was also an important person here in San Diego in a variety of ways, Math for America and UCSD. She's going to be leaving, um, going overseas to live. And so we wanted to thank Barbara for all that she's done. Um, the exhibitors, special thanks to all of them. And um, I think that they're listed on the program, so you, you can also go back and, and check them. Um, our sponsors, you can see the, uh, Geocon, League of Women Voters, Math for America, the University of San Diego, and then there's uh, several groups from San Diego State, including Crimsey, where I am, and the Center for Teaching Critical Thinking and Creativity. And Joy, why don't you wave from USD, she's here, Joy Spencer, and we thank you for, for the role that you've been playing also. Um, so the plan for this evening is uh, to let Jessica speak for about 50 minutes, and we'll start that when whatever time it is that you start. Um, and um, after she's done, we'll have a chance for a discussion and questions. And so generally what we ask is that you don't ask questions during the presentation, you hold them until the end, and then we'll have a chance at the end for, for the questions. And lastly, um, I'd like to introduce my colleague and a, a wonderful science educator at San Diego State, Donna Ross, who will be introducing our speaker. Donna. It's a great pleasure for me, and excuse me, I don't have much of a voice today, so, um, so I'll talk very briefly. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Jessica Parker. Um, I've known her now for quite a long time. She um, got her degrees from UC Berkeley. And then she went on to work at uh, Sonoma State, so part of the CSU system, and I got to know her during those years. She was working with both pre-service and in-service teachers with the educational technology and also um, all areas of STEM, really. And it was through some committee work and projects that we did that I got to know her and got to see the passion for the maker movement really grow during those years. She was an assistant professor, associate professor, and chair of her department, all really quickly. And she created a certificate program in the maker movement. But I think what I was so impressed by was throughout these years, she had this knack, and if you talked to her the last hour, you probably already saw it, for being able to bring people together. <clears throat> so people from the community, from schools, from universities, um, from her county office of education where she was. I mean, she really <coughs> brought them together to bring and create programs that made a difference for students. And so that ability to do that and with Really no ego. I mean, you're just amazingly humble with all that you do. Um, it's just such, been such a pleasure to work with her. I was sorry to see her leave the CSU system, but I wasn't at all surprised that Maker Ed essentially created this position and stole her away. Um, and she is now the Education Community Manager. Um, and so with that, would you help me give her a warm welcome, Dr. Jessica Parker. How's that? Can you guys hear me in the back? Okay, great. Um, thanks so much. I, I feel like I shouldn't talk, we should just sit around and talk with one another. There's so much wealth of knowledge um, here. So thank you very much for having me. Um, I want to talk about what I think is, quote, the modern maker movement and its impact on education. And so I want to look at specifically insights, opportunities, and also challenges, and kind of start broad and then dive into K-12 specifically. 
um, Donna talked about that I have a background in teacher education, digital literacy, and also um, technology. But really what drew me to actually join Maker Ed and, and leave a tenured position, right, um, was the sense of community. I got into the Maker Movement by going to um, a mini Maker Fair in Oakland um, when I lived there at the time um, with my, I think my son was two at the time, and I cannot tell you how long we spent at the rocket station, right? And he, he was two, barely, you know, walking, running, crawling, whatever he needed to do to like use that bike pump to get that, um, you know, paper rocket up in the air. And that was inspiring not only to me, because it really resonated with me as an educator. I taught English, um, not only in middle school and high school, um, but then to see my son so excited with paper and tape going up in the air for literally two hours uh, is really what drew me to the maker movement and said, hey, this is, this is what I want to do. Um, so thanks so much for having me. Um, let's talk about Maker Ed real quick. We are, well, our mission is really to support educators like yourselves to not only provide the training and community and resources you need to really create engaging, motivating, and inspirational um, learning opportunities for your youth and even your colleagues through making. And so in our minds, um, the goal of making is to really to inspire, to be creative, and to create those open-ended um, resources for educators that can then translate into amazing, deep participatory learning. Um, so that's what I get to do on a daily basis. I hope you guys are asking the question though, what in the world is making? And why does it matter? Because I hope that at least I can share with you what my definitions are, and I would love to hear um, throughout the night what yours are as well. So, what I would love to do is talk about what I think and what my colleagues think at Maker Ed around making. We define it in its simplest form in terms of the act of creating. And we do that on purpose, right? Because in order to define making, you have to say, what's the purpose of making? Who are the people involved? Is it my now five-year-old son? Is it my 68-year-old mother? Um, who, what is the purpose of that? And what might be the parts and pieces, the materials and tools that they need to actually engage that purpose? And so for us as an organization, and for me personally, to be inclusive, to talk about equity and access means that we have to actually define it in a broad manner. But if that means that um, Brian over there from the STEAM Maker Robotics Challenge wants to define making in a specific way, wonderful. Because that's who, Brian, where are you Brian? I'm gonna call you out. There it is, make sure you talk to Brian. I did, at a wonderful chat. And they're defining making it in a very specific way, which is wonderful, because they're focused on STEAM and they're focused on challenges, right? But that might be very different from Where's Ashanti from the chill, uh, Tinkering Studio? There she is. Make sure you hang out with her. She might define um, making as tinkering. And that is great because she knows her community at the Fleet Science Center. And so in order to actually leave making broad, it allows us then to be more inclusive, to actually have opportunities to think outside of a STEM box, if you will. Because um, so often making is associated with STEM, which is wonderful. I mean, let's talk about why that happens. Um, so let's start with some youth then. I want to share with you two youth and discuss not only what you see, what resonates with you, but listen to their stories as makers. So here's the first story of Sasha and her two siblings. And let's pray that this works. <coughs> okay. I always hear like big noises in a room, and you hear a bunch of hammering, and then building and grilling. One time I was hammering something and then I was like, wait, this is a good beat. And so I started hammering random things in my lab. What's similar between music and making is that they both have the ability of freedom. You can do whatever you want. I'm Sasha. I'm 14 years old and I'm going to the 10th grade. The first time that I knew I had test anxiety was in 8th grade. It was our midterm for English. And I studied really hard for it. And I just remember sitting down at the test. My hands were shaking and I just was freaking out. And then got a really bad grade. I was going on a trip with my family. And I remember just walking through a cave and I see a little hole inside the cave. So I asked the cave guide, what's behind that? Is there like a, another room or something? He's like, we don't know. We don't want to destroy the caves. And I was like, huh, dad, why don't we build a robot that can go inside there and scan the cave and map it out so we know if the cave is worth being destroyed for that small hole or not. Sasha building stuff. I'm like, hey, I can build stuff also. 
my name is Elena. I'm 10 years old and I'm going to fifth grade. A creative person can be anyone, I think. No one has to tell you what to do. You can just like build anything you want. One, two, three, fire! gave me a VCR player and it was all broken and right now I'm trying to take it apart and I'm seeing the components. My name is Kai, I'm 11 years old and I'm going to 6th grade. This is like a big problem to me. When it gets overly hard, I feel like it's not going to be possible. I don't give up because I always know if you just keep trying, you'll get it one time at least. Before I started the project, I felt like I wasn't the making type. I felt as if I was incapable of building something. After I built the project, I felt stronger and that boosted me up and saying, hey, you know, I can actually do something. I feel more free when I'm making. Sasha and her two siblings. And so um, I now want to take us, she lives in the Bay Area. I now want to take us to a little girl in Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, and let's talk, do you know what's going to happen? She um, is a new lawyer. So let's learn about her and her dad. Let's. I apologize. I oh, City Finals. Our next athlete is Lila McCall. She's got her Girls Are Superstar shirt on and she's ready to go. In three, two, one. First up is the newly redesigned quintuple steps. A new obstacle for her this year, but she's making short work of it. On to the fourth one. Through to the fifth one. And look at that, no hands, all right. <laughs> and onto the balance beam. She's pretty familiar with this. No scaredy cats this time. And now onto a new obstacle, the teeter log. She's got a big crowd here today. And whoa, almost falls off there. Now onto the cargo climb. Very quickly up the cargo climb, up to the top over the log, crosses over the first shed through the grocery cart conference table. <laughs> now that's the second cart reference we've seen there. Not really sure what that is. Must, uh, must be an inside joke. All right, now she's on her way down the second shed on the roof, onto the platform, across the bridge, and onto the zip line. Once again, she has a lot of her stuff in it, friends out here that she has a lot of course today. And here she goes. Oh my goodness, I'm going to have one hand in over the water bottles. And she makes it, no problem. Now, onto the hanging steps at Christmas Tree Corner. There is every Christmas tree that Lila has decorated in her five years. Kind of a strange collection, but uh, also kind of cool, I guess. She's working her way through this very tough section that requires a lot of concentration. Her boat almost falls off there. That was very close, but she regains her balance and got a big smile on her face. And she's done it. Now, on to the next obstacle actually named by Lila, the log thingies. <laughs> it makes it look easy. We can skip a few at the end there. Now she's on her way to the warp wall, getting a running start. And yes, she's made it up the warp wall. See, it's 23 seconds, and she's on her way to Vegas. On her way to Vegas. All right. Well, so that was what do we notice about these? So, these two girls and these videos and these makers, 
Um, I want you to turn to a neighbor, please, and actually talk to them. Share out this, maybe two, two and a half minutes. Go for it. What do you notice? So pride, accomplishment, going through the design process, um, strong. You can see it on their faces. Yeah, what else came up? I think there's a lot of, um, just in both of them, probably a lot of family and community. Mm -hmm. And the first one, the girl said that she asked her father, like, mm -hmm. why don't we make a robot to do this? And then the second one, she's doing this obstacle course, but her dad's narrating, and it's, you know, the possibility that they, like, mm -hmm. made that, created it together, mm -hmm. versus the kind of more hands-off approach. Yeah, so community, family definitely involved. Yeah, um, and it, I think with Lila, they started inside and had obstacle courses. So if you search for Ninja Warrior courses, Warrior courses, you will actually see a ton of this. Right? There's a whole community out there kind of doing their own obstacle courses. And it got so big that they had to move outside. She actually, if you scroll down on the YouTube page, she has a GoFundMe site um, because her dad needed more materials. Uh, and she did, he just wanted $800 and he raised over, I think, 1200 in a matter of like months. And people were commenting from as far as wide as Australia. Wow. Yeah, other things that came up. Confidence when taking risks. A lot of times adolescent girls will start being self-conscious and worrying about failing and these girls just went full steam ahead and took the risk and you know. yeah confidence taking risk and uh, full steam ahead yeah great I'm repeating this so we can make sure we get it on the video not not to be annoying so <laughs> <laughs> oh and I get a thumbs up from the media guy great <laughs> anything else come up for you guys thank you well um, I think we covered most of them and I think the overall passion as well. You saw on their faces, but I think you also saw it in terms of the dad was excited as well in terms of um, uh, the Denver, Colorado piece, and also collaborative. I mean, there's a lot of people involved with this, right? You get the sense that not only did they go and talk to the cave guys with Sasha, but then 
her siblings were there with her, the mom and dad I know, I've met them both. I'm very supportive of that, and I love the focus on intergenerational. I think making has such a wonderful way to bring people of all ages together and to actually allow for mentorships across ages, right? So a seven-year-old can teach somebody, um, you know, teach an older person about design and 3D printing. Um, and just as an uh, older person like my father, who just retired as an engineer, can teach me about certain things as well. And so I love that approach because so often within cool schools, I feel like that's missing. And yet the maker movement really allows for that. Um, the ethos of sharing, I mean, this is on YouTube. I got these on YouTube, right? And so for Lila to actually be able to post this with her dad, asking for feedback and support with the GoFundMe page, and of course, the issue around time, space, and money. These folks have backyards, right? We saw their backyards. Um, the parents have time, and they have potentially some sort of money, right, funding. Maybe they didn't have a ton of funding, but now they have more funding, $1,200, uh, to create more. And so that's an issue as well that we have to talk about with making in terms of equity and access. Not everyone has a backyard. Not every, not every parent or guardian has time, and we certainly don't all have money, right? And so these are issues that come up that I want us to continue to talk about tonight. So thank you for that. Let's dive into, though, why the maker movement now? Because I would argue that making is, has always been happening. Making is a human endeavor, it's innate. But why is there such thing called a maker movement now? So I want to look at really what I think um, is happening in terms of three things that are coalescing. And I wouldn't argue that these are the only the three things. These are three things that I want to highlight tonight. And I would love to hear what you guys think are contributing to this maker movement right now at this certain time. I also want to make sure that we're aware that making is part of our culture. Right? It's part of who we are. And so therefore, there's always ways that we have to, we can celebrate what we see, but also be critical of it, right? I mean, we're not perfect. We don't live in a perfect society. Not everything is equitable. And so we need to make sure then that as we're celebrating and promoting making with these two amazing young girls, that we're also thinking critically about it and thinking, is there room to improve? Are there ways that people are being left out? Um, are there specific definitions of making that aren't being included? And so that's what I want to make sure we cover tonight, get to that point around equity that's so important, not only to this evening, but to your guys' organizations. So the first thing I think we need to talk about is technology and the quote-unquote supposedly democratization of technology. Right? We are living in a time where there's relatively, relatively cheap hardware that I think most of you probably have in your pocket, open source hardware, uh, software that you've heard tonight about as well, um, and also a low floor, high ceiling, and wide walls that Papert and also Resnick from MIT coined <coughs> in terms of low floor, a low barrier of entry. The products that we have nowadays are designed so well that my mother can actually turn this phone on. <laughs> She's 68, right? Um, and so that low barrier of entry is essential in terms of the tools and technologies we have. In terms of the high ceiling, thinking about the opportunities to go crazy in terms of the sophistication, to shoot for the moon, if you will, and the wide walls to be able to be inclusive of multiple kinds of projects, not just making has to equal this or making has to equal that, to allow for that inclusivity. And so I think because we're in this digital age, and because we have relatively cheap hardware, open source software, this is having a huge impact on the new maker movement. If you've ever been to a maker fair, which San Diego has one, along with the mini maker fair, and there's a Steam um, Maker Robotic Challenge this weekend, right, that you should also attend as well, you will see that people are using these amazing tools and technologies. I think we also need to talk about the internet, especially in terms of um, the license to create, to share, like Lila was doing. Also, engage. There's an open invitation currently with the internet, especially for young folks, especially. This is an extension of their hand. This is not a technology. This is part of who they are, right? And the research out of digital media learning field, whether it's MacArthur Foundation or UC Irvine or Berkeley or USC, says over and over again that they feel like they have a, a constant invitation to engage, to learn, to connect. We see that all the time, right? They're constantly on their phones. And so we can talk about the pros and cons of that, but I think that's playing into this maker movement, the sense of connection. And you see it in terms of meetups. How many of you actually have been to a meetup before? Yeah, it's a way to come together face to face. It's great that I want to hang out with you online, but I want to see you as well. And so we see an uptake in terms of um, meetups, and even maker educator meetups. Has anyone been to a maker educator meetup? Yeah, we have robust ones in the Bay Area where I'm from, um, and we're trying to promote those as well because we know when people come together, when educators especially come together and share what they're doing, share their practices, that improves their own morale, and that improves what they feel like they can take back to their classroom, take back to their schools. 
The other thing I want to talk about too is part of you know being part of innovation. We are at a time in which um, you can actually go on Etsy, see handcrafted materials that people make, purchase it, and actually have it come to your door. That is phenomenal, right? That I mean, think about it. I'm 42, and the thought of having like being able to find someone when I was a kid that handcrafted a magnetic owl that I wanted to get. It's like, well, where do I go? You know, I have to like figure out. I don't, I don't even know where to begin. You know, who's who's part of the knitting group? Um, can I take that owl that they're making and then connect it to a magnet? Like, how's that going to happen? Like, that wasn't even on my radar as a kid. And now all I have to do is go to a web, you know, Etsy, where all these artists and makers are crafting materials, and there it is. I can also, if I feel so inspired, start my own Kickstarter campaign, campaign and say, I have an idea. Here's a video that I've created about my idea. Can you guys give me money? And I'll either give you a badge, or I'll send you what part of it, or I'll give you a discount. That is phenomenal in terms of the culture of innovation that we're living in. So I wouldn't go so far to say that the means of mass production have changed, right? But I think we have wonderful examples of how people have taken their nuggets of ideas and actually created new tools and technologies. We've been able to be part of that innovative experience. Um, if you think about this iPad and this iPhone, iPhone, when did this come out? What year? 2007. Yeah, nine years ago. iPad, when did that come out? 2010, right? Six years ago. That is like baby amount of time, you know, compared to when we used the quill from like the sixth century all the way up. Right? I mean, if you think about it, that was the writing instrument of the time for centuries. And in a matter of nine years, we have all these different tools. We, we're still writing, we're just writing in different ways. So if we think about um, the culture of innovation we're in, and I just did this randomly, I just Googled TED Talks, electronics, and look who came up. Over on the left, Mitch Resnick, MIT, who helped to co-found Scratch, open source software. Um, coding software. <laughs> Keep going to the right, Jay Silver of Makey Makey, um, another phenomenal product out of MIT. Uh, Massimo, over here on the right, Italian, who did Arduino. Arduino. There we go. On the left here, um, Adai uh, Madir, who did Little Bits. Yeah, keep mm -hmm. going. Amory Thomas from St. Paul University with the Squishy Circuits with Play Doh and Connections. And of course, Leo Blukley, sorry, Leo Blukley. I'm doing lily pad. All I did was Google TED Talk and electronics. And these are folks that said, I have an idea. They happen to all be connected to universities and communities that like we talked about were important, right? In terms of um, Sasha and Lila. And actually put their innovations to market. Do any of you have any of their products? Let's see, show of hands. Little bits, are doing okay? Yeah. Another issue that I think is happening besides the democratization of technology is also kind of socioeconomic, social cultural issues. Um, and what's important is that we, we've gone through a recession, right? And there was a downturn in the economy. And so that means why are people out of work? What kind of work is there? And we've been rethinking the work that we have. What are the options for me? Right? And so of course there's a refocus on STEM. Let's refocus on the workforce development and actually think about STEM as a way to get people back to work in different kinds of jobs. And so we have to think about um, how these social cultural and, and social economic issues have played into this kind of rise of the maker movement. We also have kind of a return to what America made things. We live in a very different time than we did in the 1950s in terms of manufacturing. And so that's another issue that's coming up is like, remember when America made things? Well, we still do make things. We definitely do. We just don't at the same quantity that we used to. And so the maker movement also plays, I think, into that as well. Then you saw these folks who actually are promoting products, actually making things, an assembly line in Italy or in St. Paul, Minnesota. We also have um, the culture of innovation that I've also I've already alluded to, but look at those innovators, right? Steve Jobs, um, Gates there, Alan Turing. And what's important is that I think those companies now are asking that folks that come in, they want to hire folks that are collaborative that are creative, that can think critically. We didn't hear that when I was growing up. At least, I didn't think we heard that. Do you have a high school degree? Do you have a college degree? Okay, you get a J-O-B. That's how it went. <laughs> and now they're saying, no, we want you to be collaborative and creative, which is wonderful. It's, it's great. So, and we have an intense focus on what's the Silicon Valley doing? What are they, what's their culture? 
So we all have to get bouncy balls, and all have to make sure that we're taking naps and eating quinoa and things like that, which maybe that's wonderful. But it's kind of an intense focus on how Silicon Valley doing it and how, how's innovation happening in general. And so this is kind of the perfect time then for maker movement to come together around innovation, around technology, around creativity and collaboration. So those are kind of, in my mind, what I think are some of the important socioeconomic and social cultural issues. I also think we have to point out kind of um, <coughs> Dale Doherty and Make, Make Magazine. Dale Doherty is behind um, Maker Media, came off of O'Reilly, which was really about technical workbooks and supports for folks that were interested in engineering, computing, et cetera. And he saw a niche in terms of Make Magazine. Those DIY folks that are in their garages, those the gates and the jobs, they need a magazine for them. They, they were white, they were upper class, they were men, and that's who Dale is targeted, right? But he has a publishing company in 2016. That's huge. He also then saw, well, we want those communities to come together. So let's have a maker fair. And so he launched that in 2006, a year after he launched Make Magazine, the first Bay Area Maker Fair. Has anyone ever been to the Bay Area Maker Fair? What's, what's it like? It's awesome. <laughs> fire and things flying. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy bikes, flyer and things, uh, fire and things flying. It's awesome. Anybody else want to share? It's massive. It, it feels um, almost overwhelming that there's so many people there. And it's on a county fairgrounds and it's packed for three days straight, right? Um, and there are flagship fairs then not only in the Bay Area but also in New York and DC internationally. And there's many maker fairs all over the world because people come together to say, hey, this is what I've made. Sasha's there, right? Sasha was on the main stage actually at the last year's Bay Area Maker Fair. You know, talking about what she had done. Um, and you guys are a great example as well. You guys have a mini Maker Fair. You guys have um, a Maker Fair in general as well, I think, out of Balboa Park. The other thing that I think is happening in terms of social cultural issues is politics and media. You'll see here of folks saying, hey, um, not only the president saying, I want to have a, a White House Maker Fair, which he did in 2014. He also had the National Week of Making. He dedicated a week in June, all, last year in 2015, and also this year in 2016. This June, I was on Capitol Hill, having a Capitol Hill panel and ma mini Maker Fair in the Capitol building. And so there's ways that not only our government, but also NSF, National Science Foundation, has been investing in making. And of course, the media has as well. And, you, and I would probably, yeah, if you, if you force me to kind of pick a side, I would say the media does a great job of promoting making as STEM only. And I would love to see it open up and be more inclusive of things beyond STEM, whether that's STEAM or keep going. But I think these are some of the things that have also played into um, how the maker movement has come about. I also think making's profitable, right? We spend quality money on buying things as a nation and making, if you go into any Barnes and Nobles, have you seen the make, yeah, right? Have you seen, they have books, they have toys, and they have make stuff. I go with my, there in my family and I'm like, ah, in heaven for like three hours. It's like my three favorite three. Oh, they have food too. Like, I mean, I don't even need to leave. It's amazing. <laughs> but making is a site that is a profitable site and we have to think about those issues around power and access. So, we can't forget though really the long and rich history of this country though. So often with him making, if, if the media and the president um, and whoever else, the National Science Foundation are saying making is STEM, then what happens to this rich history that we have? I mean, think about the, the amazing arts and crafts movement that we had in the, in the early 1900s, all the way to today. You guys have amazing art museums here, right? That didn't come out of nowhere. That came because our country has invested in craftsmanship, in being makers and saying craftsman is, is quality. Let's make something that's quality and beautiful. Um, and we honor and appreciate that. So we can't forget about this amazing arts and crafts movement that we had here and abroad. I think also progressive educators. Here's Dewey, one of my heroes. We, got, we have a long history of pro progressive educators promoting hands-on, experiential, kids learning by doing. Vocational education. I grew up at a time where I could take auto, wood, metal, drafting. I, I couldn't take it though until I fulfilled my other courses, so I got to do it my senior year. Right? And I was like, oh, I really like this drafting stuff. I didn't even know I was creative. Here I am, 17 years old, and that's the first time I have an opportunity. 
And yet we have this long, rich history of vocational ed. Can I see a show of hands? Who actually had opportunities to do vocational ed? Yeah, yeah. And of course we have spaces for making. Uh, the hands-on, minds-on learning that not only the Children's Museum, a long, rich history of that here in San Diego with the new Children's Museum, but dating back to the 1960s with the New York Hall of Science, the Exploratorium in San Francisco, um, thinking about the Magic House in, in St. Louis, and of course Legoland, where I spent a lot of money this past summer bringing my family down. Um, and I, I have to admit that we spent a lot of time in the hotel where there was like free Legos, and they just built the entire time. I was in there too, building, right, making with those bricks that are phenomenal. So we have this long, rich history. And to quote Dewey, I think, give the pupils, give the learners something to do, not something to learn. And the doing is of such nature as to man thinking, learning naturally happens. I think that's so important for us as educators to remember the doing, something to do, that it includes that process of learning, trying to figure it out. Um, he, he's one of my heroes, so that's why I threw up that quote. But I'm sure you guys have plenty of educational heroes as well that relate to that. So we still need to ask ourselves some tough questions though, because even though the maker movement is made up of tinkerers, creators, makers, designers, who make things for many different reasons, for profit, for fun, for a challenge, and even though makers tend to value that learning process, they value each other in this community that we're, we're part of, um, and the sharing and the feedback, and also the documentation, we still live in a culture in which we're not perfect. So we have to be able to see the possibilities as well as the critique. And so like any good educator, we're gonna always engage in ongoing reflection and analysis. So here are some of the questions I want us to be able to ask ourselves. First has to do with boundaries. What is and what is not making? What counts? And for me, that means that it depends on your community, it depends on your people, right? I can't answer that question for you, because who are your learners? And what, what do they wanna make? Start with them, and then we can talk about boundaries. History and power, right? We have to be able to talk about who polices these boundaries then. Then do we have a say in terms of what is making? Especially that lineage of before it was considered making, right? We've been making all the time. It was Make Magazine that coined Maker back in 2005. So is there a way that we could actually honor that lineage? And if so, whose history then is included? Here in San Diego, who are makers? That's a great question. Who gets to identify as makers? And that's going to change from city to city, county to county, potentially state to state, and school to school. And that's a tough thing for, I think, educators, and especially a school system to handle, because so often we want the one right answer. We want the one way to do it so we can replicate it. Making doesn't fit into that. Your square peg, round hole. And we also have to talk about equity and identity, right? We can't just reify the digital divide, especially if we define making as having access to 3D printers, laser cutters, and vinyl cutters. I love them, don't get me wrong, but if we do that, we're just um, exasperating the digital divide we already live in. How would just make the digital divide also? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so if she said the flip side of that might be having so much technology that they don't have access to the deep, rich learning um, opportunities within the maker movement, if I paraphrase correctly. Yeah. Um, and we want to make sure that we're not reinforcing forms of marginalization across gender, across race, across class. Right? These are things we have to think about. So, on Makerhead, we purpose purposely define making in a broad manner. So there's multiple entry points of opportunity. So I know that you're at this point, you're like, oh, Jessica, this is so much to think about. Let me give you some inspiring examples. <laughs> How does that sound, right? Um, so we had Sasha, we had Lila, and their families, and those were outside of school, right? They were passionate about their own interests, they were passionate about their own experiences, and they were inspiring. But when it comes to educators who are infusing making into K-12 setting, we're really noticing a trend among administrators among principals and superintendents and teachers. But let's start with the, those administrators. I'm gonna share with you folks that have actually taken a chance and invested in making and um, give you some examples of what they're actually doing in schools. So the first one is a clip from Schaefer Charter School um, up north in Santa Rosa, which is north of San Francisco. 
And I want to share with you how the principal, Gina Silvera, actually revised their traditional summer school, threw out traditional summer school, and instead did a maker camp. Here she is. set on it and you don't and you try not to give up. That's what it's like about to be a maker. My favorite part of maker camp is learning how to make all these new stuff. You made some cool things so far. Like when you combine the ideas you can probably you can create a really good thing. It's really fun being a maker and make Maybe when you when you get older you could uh, make something that nobody's ever thought of before. I thought like uh, making stuff was pretty much hard and like kind of frustrating, <coughs> but actually it turned out to be fun because like uh, like um, like the ideas like you get might be kind of like um, like excitement like you feel when you come here it's like pretty cool like, like yeah. <coughs> <laughs> one of you like the next so my name is Gina Silvera. I'm the principal here at Schaefer Charter School in the Pioneer Olivet Union School District. And the first time that I heard about um, Maker Camp, Maker Movement, um, was through the camps I've seen in summer. I have two children myself, and looking through different flyers, I've seen Maker Camps and um, have gotten interested in it. And was fortunate this year to take a tour with some people from the Sonoma County Office of Education of different maker spaces in elementary through high school. Um, really taken, like loved it, loved everything I saw. And then we got tickets to go to the Maker Fair in San Mateo. So I went with my husband and everything I saw there just floored me. It was amazing. And so I wanted to kind of bring that to kids in our district and figure out a way to have a camp here. You gotta try this. Go, go, go. go. Uh, Everybody stop, stand back, take a look at it and think, where is things going wrong? Where is Will Hart is a second grade teacher here at Schaefer and he is the brains behind our maker camp. Um, I mean, I'm the one that kind of talked to Jenny about having it, our superintendent, and um, getting that going, but Will is really the one who constructed everything and came up with all the projects. And it's been a lot of fun because along the way, I've learned a lot just hanging out with him. What courses are you going to That I didn't know until I kind of asked him about it and then found out, oh my gosh, this is like this guy's calling. So um, he's been really, really helpful in getting that started. I'm going to pause there, um, and I'm more than happy. I, I'm going to make sure I give my slides to Randy and folks, um, so that way you can have access to these links, because uh, I think um, you want to watch it in its entirety. But what you what you should notice there is the focus on a principal saying, hey, I went to something, I thought it was great, let's test it out and try it. And in that, not only does she see this teacher who um, is a 20 plus year veteran teacher come alive in a different way, you know, and let's keep, um, Nope, I was going to say something, but it's, I'm being videotaped, so I should not say that. Um, but what is important is that she took a risk, she took a chance, and not only did that allow her students to thrive, right, and she had a parent um, come in and say, you know, my kid loves this, I, I, can't, I can't believe you guys are doing this, this is great. And she was able to see a kid that might be considered a problem child actually now in a new light, because he was there working so long in the mini golf course because that was what was exciting to him. I also want to share an example of Meadow Elementary School. Um, Melissa Becker, our principal there, and this is in Petaluma, also up north, uh, was interested in integrating making into her school and had an unused portable. So she thought, well, we have no money. What do I do? So she actually invented the Ziploc challenge. She gave every child in her K-5 elementary school a Ziploc bag and said, go home, find something that you want to donate to the makerspace and put it in that Ziploc bag. And so the next day, um, you start to see the materials that she got. Dominoes, marbles, um, recycled materials, uh, marble machine tubes, cardboard. And so just by giving that challenge to kids, saying, hey, is there something you can contribute? And if you can't, recycle something, right? If you can't afford it and there's something that you don't want to give up, we understand that, but can you pull out your recycling bin? 
and actually give us something. And through that, she had all the materials she needed to actually start making. And she started teaching herself. A principal found time in her schedule because it was so important to her to start teaching and use that as a learning opportunity then for her teachers. Because she knew she didn't want to put making as another thing to add to my plate, right? None of us want that as teachers. And so that's the way she demonstrated to our colleagues that look, look at this engagement, look at this excitement. Um, let's move now to New Jersey, where we have Glenn Robbins, who is a principal and also superintendent of the area. And instead of actually having a separate makerspace, which they do have now, he started making in the hallways and said, I'm going to team up with the IT department and dust off all those computers that don't work and throw them out in the hall and see what happens. So this is what happens. Kids start to take them apart. He also then removed the outdated trophies from the trophy case. I apologize for those from the 1940s that had a trophy. But he took them out and said, what do you guys want to do? And so they designed it as, um, as you see right there, the, there's the girls in there having their own kind of montage taking place. <laughs> he also then put up Lego boards and said, in the halls, create what you want to create um, and have a blast. And so you'll see here they are between um, building on the wall. And he also then had them create the student-led ed camp here. And ed camp is kind of an unconference theme where you come in and say, what do you want to what do you want to learn today? And you write on a post-it note what you think you want to talk about, and then if something's written on the post-it note and Randy wrote it down, I'm going to hang out with Randy, and Randy's going to tell me what, and have a conversation. And so they now have an elective, a student-led ed camp period, and here they are determining what they want. Um, do you want to build it? Do you want to design an app? Or do you want to do something else? And that's the way that Glenn has promoted it. He said, quote, too often makerspaces are confined to certain classrooms or libraries where the majority of the student body and staff don't have access to it. Focus on building up your maker and design culture for all to be part of, instead of hiding them in certain pockets of greatness in your building. Right? Just by throwing stuff out of the hallways, he's created now a culture of making and design. We move down to Virginia and Charlottesville with Pam Moran. If you do not know Pam Moran, she is amazing. I would Google her right now. She's um, the superintendent of Albemarle County Public Schools, and she considers her district a maker district. And so they actually put in then to their strategic plan making. But making wasn't the only thing, right? It's not making has to be everything. She included in the values what they call the seven pathways that they find important as a district. And you can see those seven pathways include choice and comfort for kids, um, universe, universal design for learning, although it says university, sorry, it should say universal design for learning, UDL, project problem and passion-based learning, interactive technology, connectivity, and number four is maker-infused curriculum making was able to complement these other principles and practices she already had. And they wove that into the strategic learning plan. So that way educators could say, here's how we are meeting the needs of our students. Because the goal wasn't to create makers, the goal was to create lifelong learners. And making was a vehicle then to actually create lifelong learners. Right? Let's actually dive into Virginia and look at Walton Middle School in Albemarle. Um, this is a great story. Superintendent Moran reached out to our organization called Public Workshop, who came to help really facilitate, redesign, and recreate the only place where everyone actually in the school went to, the cafeteria. Students hated the cafeteria. So the goals for this project were to connect students during their free time. They were noticing students were disconnected, even across race and gender and different um, years, right? And they wanted to be able to provide personal learning spaces for hanging out and, of course, learning. So together, the students created you ready for this? Rolling tree houses. And here they are together, building their tree houses, redesigning not only why these were important, the space itself, but using the cafeteria to its fullest potential. They ran out of wood. So what did they do? They went out and cut, a, cut down a tree. <laughs> and here they are hauling it back because they're in a rural area. Here they are putting up the tree. And here's what they said about it. Yeah. She has a TED Talk that is fabulous. Again, her name is Pam Moran. Um, so I gave you examples of administrators because so often I think the focus is on teachers. And I think too often the focus is on teachers for them to create change, for them to empower, for them to provide agency. When in fact, who has the most power is usually the administrators. And so there are some amazing examples of what administrators have done. But I don't want you to think classroom teachers aren't doing it. They are. They are integrating it. I actually conducted a survey of educators enrolled in the Maker Certificate Program at Sonoma State last year. Um, either they were participants or instructors, and I, so I want to talk to you about what they thought was the most important thing about making, in terms of maker-centered learning. So 
So they thought it was kind of the trifecta of social emotional development, technical skills, and academic learning. And so if you focus on social emotional learning, they often discussed it in terms of engagement, instant engagement for kids in terms of making. They talked about a learner's willingness to learn new things, that like, I'm gonna try this, I'm gonna take a risk, like we talked about earlier with um, Sasha. To struggle through fr frustration, to be more open to collaboration. Actually, we heard Sasha's brother talk about struggling through frustration, right? Oh, I can't do this, I can try. And to seek resources and really mine the wisdom of the room through making. In the survey I conducted, they also talked about the value of the process, that making allowed them to really discuss the process as students, as problem solvers, um, on iterating, building on an idea that was generative not only for the learners, but also for the educators. And what I think is important too is learning how to learn. And not only learning how to learn, but learning how to interact with other people. One educator summed it up by saying, quote, making supports a changing mindset toward learning and each other. And that was from a 20 year veteran who taught in independent schools. Right? She was blown away. Um, what's wonderful is that that response from that 20 year veteran really resonates with research that's coming out of Harvard. Um, I want you to look up this project. It's a research project called Agency by Design. Not only do they have a white paper from 2015, from January, but they're also coming out with a book based on their three year research with 10 plus schools on making. And they have phenomenal ideas called Thinking Routines out of Project Zero and Howard Gardner that really apply to maker center learning. Um, but in that pa white paper that came out in 2015, they really talked about the social emotional learning. And so here's a quote. The most salient benefits of maker-centered learning for young people have to do with developing a sense of self and a sense of community that empower them to engage with and shape the design dimensions of their world. So it's one thing for me, right, as a former associate professor at Sonoma State to tell you, here's what the educators said. I feel like it's another thing for Harvard to come out and say, here's the benefits of making. And it's not only just about technical skills and academic learning, it's about a sense of self and empowerment to think that their world is changeable. Now, if that isn't a rationale for why we need to infuse making a capable setting, I don't know what is, right? That's phenomenal. I also, um, in the survey, talked, about, talked to the educators. I said, what's the most inspirational thing? And they said, um, it changed their outlook on teaching. Engaging the maker and making education changed what they thought. It made me a more calm, confident educator. I was reinvigorated. I felt like a new teacher. I was happy. Right? I thought I was going to quit teaching, and now I'm inspired because I'm doing inspired curriculum. What have you heard a veteran educator say I'm inspired? Right? We don't hear it enough. We need to be hearing it more often. We cannot continue to lose educators because of a system that's designed around measurement and assessment of very limited notions of learning. And my favorite? It's revitalized my teaching. It, it, they reflect the values that made me want to be an educator. So those are quotes from the educators themselves. But what's been great too is it changed their practice. My teaching is much more open. I'm willing to stand back and let them explore. So not only did it infect, affect them on a professional level and personal level, it, it changed the way they taught. I allow students to explore now. I can stand back and offer more active and, and student-directed classrooms. I feel like making has given me permission, given me permission to have more active and student-directed classroom. That's phenomenal. So let's wrap this up and then open it up to questions and discussion around key insights, key opportunities, and key challenges for K-12. Um, and I, of course, I want to hear what your ideas are as well. But I mean, we know the maker movement isn't just about tools and gadgets. It's about people engaging with things that they love and then sharing that love of learning with others. Really, that for me is what defines the maker movement. And so if we start from the fact that we all think, we know that we're makers, that every child is a maker, then we can move away from a deficit model that says you don't have knowledge, you don't have skills as a youngster, and say you are a wealth of knowledge and you bring funds of knowledge into what you're doing because you're a human being who knows how to make. And I'm gonna step back and give you that opportunity. That allows us to have the ability to let making flourish and the students to flourish. I invite you to step back and see what happens when you allow them to make. I also think that we've got to remember, sorry? Oh, okay, sure. 
Um, I also think that we can foster real classroom and school change across pedagogy, curriculum, the organization, and materials by engaging in every child as a maker. I also think we have to remember that the top taker, maker tools over and over again in the research are not the 3D printers and the laser cutters. It's glue, card holder, cord, and tape, right? And some hand tools thrown in, a hammer and a screwdriver. Those are the top tools to make. And so if we can find those tools, you can make. Or you can, you can make in other ways as well with office supplies. That's like one of my best things ever to keep my kids busy. And I, I want to make sure that we don't just allow making for the gate kids, the AP kids, the, the upper middle class kids, right? It's for every child. We have to fully believe that, that there's potential in all of those kids. And let's not pigeonhole making into specific disciplines or tools. Let's think about that cardboard. Um, I forgot to mention that I know I gave you two girls, Sasha and Lila, but if you haven't seen Cade's Arcade, you need to Google that as well. That's of a young boy, nine-year-old, who creates a cardboard arcade out of cardboard, right? And phenomenal, just based on that. The media articles I showed you along with the TED Talks all highlight making as inherently tied to STEM. This is great for some schools and communities. This is wonderful, but not all, right? Others have defined it in terms of arts and crafts, designing and building, even tinkering. And so we do a disservice by forcing schools or educators to actually fit a predetermined form of making. The primary goals of making should always be to stop thinking about the purpose of making and the people involved. And based on that, what are the tools and materials that can then support those purposes and those people that are engaged? And the last thing is invest in community. Right? Don't underestimate the need for community and connection. You heard what happens when administrators infuse making in their schools, and their main goal throughout all that was to create a sense of community. Key opportunities in K-12. Start with the students. Have a discussion with them. What are you making? What are you already doing? Don't feel like you have to know it all. You don't. Just have a discussion. Start with them. They're already makers. So let's tap that potential. Let's look at and really appreciate and document kind of the learning process, right? How can we actually document the great things that are happening throughout the process, not just focus solely on the outcome or that final project? Do both. It's not either or, it's and both. And then connect making with other established principles and practices. You saw in Abomaro, right? They didn't say, throw the baby out. <laughs> throw the bathwater out. Keep the baby. Please keep the baby. Don't throw the baby out. <laughs> throw the bathwater out and let's just do making. No, they said, let's pair it with things that we believe in. Right? And let's write it into our strategic plan. So then it's actually written in stone and we can go back and mention it. And then those are the expectations not only for us, the educators, ourselves as administrators, but also the parents and the community. So PBL, inquiry. Depth of learning, uh, tons of ways that you can connect. Experiential learning, making with others. And I think there's such a huge potential now with NGSS, the opportunities to design, engineer, prototype, and iterate. So much to be learned through that, and also through design thinking. But let's not forget those challenges. Educators will like tell you all the time, there's a lack of time in the schedule, there's a lack of time to create curriculum, there's a lack of PD, right? And so those are ways that we need to actually <coughs> tap into the communities and say, how can we support them in creating time in the schedule, those administrators? We have to think about equity and access. Who has access to more intellectually complex activity? Are there gendered or racialized pattern of tool use, participation, assistance? Who's always using the 3D printer? Those are important questions we always have to ask. Are there multiple pathways or multiple ways of knowing that are supported or marginalized? When does that happen and why? And what kind of mentorship is available to youth? How can we foster that interge intergenerational activity that we saw in the very beginning of this talk? And how do we attend to the histories of practice that we come with, that we bring with us, that are rich and deep within our community here in San Diego? How do we pull on that and honor that, rather than say, nope, this is new, we're doing something new, it's making, rather than honor what's already been done and is woven in? And I think the elephant in the classroom is assessment. The elephant in the classroom is assessment. I, rather than promoting the question, how do we assess making, I think we need to say, how can making push the envelope in terms of assessment? It's forcing us to think differently about assessment when you focus so heavily on process and product, rather than a multiple choice test, right? There's so many ways that we can actually use assessment to protect maker spaces, to advocate for those who don't have access, 
to document the great work that you're all doing, that you saw those folks doing now. We have to be better at documenting and assessing formative and assumptive. Right? That is the elephant in the room that's going to actually make making into a fad. There's so many different ways that we can highlight assessment in terms of values that we have that we hold dear. And so why is making important? Well, let's look at the formative ways that the gradations of learning that happen throughout the way. Highlight those as educators. Put them on social media with permission. Or you know, don't include the face. Because we as educators have to do a much better job of showing the magnificent learning our youth are doing in schools. Otherwise, it's like it doesn't exist. Especially when you see the media, the TED Talks, the books, the focus on innovation. If we can't then actually say, here's the learning that's happening, the rich, deep, participatory learning that's happening, we can't compete with that. And I want us to be able to. I want us to be able to. And we need to address the digital divide. And head on, how can we make sure this opportunity gap isn't exacerbated by confusing making? I'm going to stop there. All right, thank you so much, and I would love to have your questions and comments. So we have um, some time for questions. We have uh, microphones that have to be turned on or you can just speak up loudly and somebody can repeat the questions. Uh, I did a fabulous job, I guess. No <laughs> questions. Yeah, I'm going to go here and then we'll go. You spoke and I hear all the time of K through 12. Oh, I'm sorry. I K through 12, but I am a big proponent of preschool. And obviously you have little ones. So are we going to push this down and start, to me, it's preschoolers that can be incredibly creative using sand and basic materials. They don't need fancy things and they can do a lot of neat maker things. So I'm kind of wondering whether you're beginning to look more down to younger little ones. Great question. I mean, in my mind, a great preschool should already be infusing making, right? With everyday materials that kids love and adore, dirt, sand, wood, etc. Um, for me personally, um, as an organization at Maker Ed, we, we can't do it all, so we focus on K-12. But yeah, and I think one of the hurdles that we have with early childhood is that early childhood's already been doing this. We have a lot to learn from early childhood, and yet if they're not familiar with the word making, they're like, well, well what's this making stuff? Is it STEM? Is it that 3D printing? We don't do 3D printing, right? But you hang out at any, most preschools, and they're doing making. Right? They're engaged in it. There's glue everywhere. Right? There's rocks everywhere. They're looking at things closely, intently. Um, they're iterating on their designs to walk on them. You know, um, whatever they might be doing. I'm thinking of my son. It's, woo, he's, he's, he's jumping off things, you know, exploring gravity. Great! Yeah, I'm making a mess. And so I feel like there's a wonderful opportunity then to learn from early childhood educators who've been doing this for so long. And to read up on Maria Montessori. Right? What, what are the values and philosophies she holds dear? Huh. So, great question. That was a lead in, actually, because my question was about, I was nearly so to study your degrees, constructive visited education, and kind of role with degree, and my son is in Montessori. My son is in Montessori, and exactly that. Like, you know, it's been termed constructivist for you know, way back when. And how is, is rebranding it as the maker movement to make it more accessible or the right avenue? Is modeling after sort of the world of Montessori, who I think is touching on it, but not taking it to this depth and this yeah. level? And so how to maybe gain from those access points and further the history that sort of was already already embedded but now has this behind or could have this behind it? Yeah. I mean I think it depends, really is the answer. I mean, does does a preschool want to go that route? Um, but those are discussions that I think we have to have, the long rich history of constructivism um, and how early childhood was really modeled on that notion of experiential play, going out there, you know, being autotelic, being in the moment. Um, and so I, I don't know the answer because I think it depends. There might be schools, there might be organizations that are Montessori that want to you know, claim the identity of maker. And there might be others that I think, no, that's not for us. And so those are discussions that we have to have. And also, I think we need to break down those barriers that make an equal STEM, like I've said 17 times tonight. Um, so I, I, I don't want that to be another frustration. Exactly. Like, this, this, this house the yes. Yeah, just like you said, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so she said she doesn't want things to, um, to be frustrated that it just gets stuck in kind of um, K2 and then, I mean, 
if you think back in your own kindergarten, I mean, did you did you actually engage in that that type of learning throughout K twelve? That what you did in kindergarten did that continue, or did learning the way you were taught, the things you were taught, the method in which you were taught change? Yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, so I think we have a lot to learn from early childhood for sure. Yeah, and then that's attention of like, do we claim that as maker? I would argue that you don't have to, but let's be open to makers, creators, designers, and 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 go that route because the maker movement there there is a level of profit there, there is a corporate investment there. Um, it's capitalism at its finest, which is great, but also has serious contradictions and drawbacks. Yeah. I run a, an elementary school library, and uh, we matriculated to tech schools. We already do project-based learning. We're very social, emotionally oriented to start off with, and our director is trying to lead us into recreating, creating the maker space in the library taking up a chunk of our space. And I'm just curious if you, in your experience, have seen when people are starting, our school is starting a maker space, kind of what is the, what do you find is the most successful way for them to start? What is the most useful type of equipment that you would put in there? Because yeah. I keep on hearing 3D printing, and I, I'm a technophobe, just by the fact that I work at a technical school. You know, I really, I work, especially with little kids, because I'm K through five, I like, my motor skill things, and I don't want everybody to be coding. So that's my slant, and I'm just wondering what your experience is. Yeah, like. great question. Especially with these younger kids. Yeah, where to start in terms of library makerspace? I'll be honest, libraries have been the cutting edge of this movement, right, in terms of K-12. Who are the champions of making? It's the librarians, right? That's where it's at, because they have the space, they have the time, they want to engage kids, they want more kids to come into the library. My, my advice is to you is start small. This, this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. Right? And I think the best thing you can do is invite those kids in to actually design, just like they did in Albemarle. They said, what do you want to redesign? And maybe that could be a way that you invite kids in and say, hey, what are we interested in? What are you already making? It might be Minecraft, right? It might end up being, we just want kinetic sand. <laughs> right? And that's, that's where you start. And then you see how it goes and you iterate and prototype on that. But I, I don't advise saying, let's throw out half the books and bring in all these technology and tools because you're doing it backwards. You gotta start with purpose and people, not tools and materials. Because think about the history of educational technology. Think about all those tools and technologies that were forced upon teachers, and guess where they ended up? By June, in the closet with cobwebs. They're still there, right? You go to any kind of high school classroom, go dig in the closets, what are you gonna find? Laser discs, right? Right? And so we don't need to repeat the history of educational technology, just because it, it's, the maker move is exciting. I mean, I think it is exciting. But the principles are based on a sense of community, a sense of purpose. What do you want to make? You know, you're you're my community. So community, what should we make together? Let's have a discussion around it, and then we can make together. Yeah. So that's what I would say. Start small, and then see what the kids want to do. And then you can always um, have who's having. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. The family maker STEM night. Where are you? Did she already, she already had her run. Nope. In the back. E I S. Yes. Okay, they're having a family STEM maker night. I would have talked to this gentleman. I, I didn't meet you, so I don't know your name. I apologize. Angel. Andrew. Angel. Angel. Great. Talk to him because, I mean, the best way is to get the community together and say, hey, what do we want more of? Right? And maybe it's they want more books. That would be phenomenal if they said that. So that would be my advice. The other thing is, say you want a documentary, Maker Edit has wonderful, um, we have a wonderful playbook called the Youth Makerspace Playbook, which is great. And I can show you that. Oh, that means I have to find it. Oh, Jessica. Hang on, hang on. Youth Maker Space Playbook. Um, this is a great resource. See, there it is. That's easier. It's a great resource over 80 pages that we put together of people in the same situation as you, kind of going through how do we do this. Yeah. Other questions, comments? So, uh, the what you put up from the white paper was like really inspirational about uh, sort of opening up uh, the vision of young people to be able to change the world around them. Uh, but I guess my question is, is that sort of the opposite? I don't see that when I go to maker fairs. People are very focused on themselves and this little project. And I was wondering if it's in the vision of the maker movement to sort of open it up to making a positive change. 
Yeah, that's a great question. It's funny you, you say that it's individuals focusing on themselves. Um, hmm. That's sort of my take from walking around yeah. the bears. Yeah. Yeah, you're agreeing. Say more. What what do you what do you why are you saying yes? Well, Tell us more. San Diego, uh, Baker Fair. It was wonderful and huge. Acres and acres and acres of trees. Hi. The San Diego Maker Fair in Balboa Park was huge and wonderful, but as you visited each booth, they had their product or their design or their idea, and they really wanted to tell you about that and sell you on it and maybe go to their GoFundMe page and help them out. Um, when you visited the kids at the Maker Fair, were the kids the same way? Um, or both of you, yeah. Like that's that that is where you see the magic because like you you had the example with your kid and you like you see the smiles and i i get it with the young people it's mm -hmm. very exploratory but I, I i don't work in k through 12 and i see more adults that are within this community and i think that because i think it becomes more siloed and less visionary yeah i can see that happening definitely I primarily work in K-12, so I often see the kids' side of things and not necessarily kind of the adult side of things. Um, but I appreciate you bringing that up, that the maker movement, um, at least the maker fair that you were referring to at San Diego, tended to show kind of um, individuals, adults, kind of showing off their project and they were very focused on their thing rather than kind of the sense of empowerment. I mean, I, I think if you kind of drilled down and asked them, do, do you feel empowered? Can you tell me more about the process in terms of the product? You might get to it. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of forums that people get involved with as adults. My husband makes sailboats in our backyard, and he's, on, he's also repairing his VW bus. So he's online all the time with other people who are doing the same thing. So there's a different sense of community, I think, for adults versus those kids. So they are, and then they get this level of expertise. So yeah, this is what they're gonna show. I know how to make a surfboard out of cardboard. Isn't this cool? Don't you wanna try it? So they get this sense of expertise, and that's what they're gonna show. So I think their enthusiasm is for that, and, and hopefully to show people that, yeah, you can do this, and let's get excited about that. I can help you figure it out. But this is what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to add on? I, it's not an add-on. Um, so you mentioned Dewey. Um, he had this activity that's going on. Can I pause you, Randy, to see if there's an add-on? Yes. Okay, is there anyone else that wants to add on to their questions about Maker Faire and kind of the intense focus of individuals on their own interests? Yeah. Thanks, Randy. <coughs> it's not on yet. It'll take this was fast. Thank you. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, my name is David Pogliano. I teach at Seawater High School. I've been doing uh, Maker Space for three years. I teach math engineering. Uh, I taught math for 13 years. I got bored out of my mind. And I teach engineering, and now I go home with great stories. It's pretty exciting and phenomenal. And um, I could talk about this for days, especially the maker space and the whole maker movement. And the superintendent visited my classroom maybe a couple months ago, maybe three or four months ago, and she's like, where do you get these ideas from? Uh, and this gentleman over here, and I've met him many times, and I say, you know what, hang out with like-minded people, Twitter, and then going to the events like this. So uh, my question is, uh, if a student creates a project in the maker space, is that similar or is it different than creating a project for science fairs? Hmm. Yeah, S say more, what, what, are you, what are you thinking? Well, um, one of my students, uh, we, we, we built this drone, we got a competition, we had some NABRA engineers support us and mentor us, and so she got into um, batteries, charging batteries, the whole idea of you have to charge them, not to explode, and she really got into it and she kept picking the engineer's brain about it and now she wants to use it for a science project, a science fair. Uh, we were just, Tinkering, right? Hackering, just having fun and studying and learning, and she really got so into it that um, she wants to be able to use that whole idea and present it at the science fair. And I want to know how much different, or if I can go and support her and the science teachers, but not invade their space. I'm coming with this hacker idea of, yeah, I'm here to saw, cut, and laser, and 3D print, and CNC all day. I'm not here to fill out paperwork and the purpose hypothesis. I'm just here to have fun. So. <laughs> That's my question. Is it the same? Is it different? A, a, um, the current science fair, is it still to support the makerspace, in other words? Or, or can makerspace support the science fair? Yeah, I think a makerspace can totally support the science fair. I mean, I think it depends on the goals. What are the goals of the science project? Right? Is it to really to have an authentic 
um, way to showcase your work? I haven't been to one with my own child, so I don't necessarily know, but it, I mean, head movement? The trifold, I hate the trifold, it's my nemesis. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it does, it does depend on the purpose, and maybe there's a time and place for a trifle, but I think we have to talk about authentic ways to, for students to present their learning, right? And I think Maker Fair can be an authentic way um, to present your learning. And I think the science, science world, science fair, could also be an authentic way to present your learning. It's not always set up like that if everyone has to use a trifle, right? There should be that choice, and I think that's one thing that making allows for us is the, the sense of choice, the sense to follow the interest-based passions, um, and to have authentic ways to showcase that aren't just the teacher with the red pen, right, or parents. Make her for puts you in front of complete and utter strangers that will ask you questions about your process, right? That is authentic, you know, and maybe the science fair um, can or can't be. So I think that's a great question. So I would say go forth and hack and, <laughs> and support that young kid, right, with batteries, definitely. Yeah, let's, um, so we didn't have any add-on, but I know Randy want to talk about Dewey. So Randy, over to you and Dewey. I just wanted, so Dewey tried a lot of these ideas. Um, it was a sort of a marvelous thing he did, but it kind of lost out. Um, American education wasn't ready for that. Uh, in fact, the way it's been remembered has sort of been unfairly treated. And I'm wondering if, if there's something about the belief system that people have for what school's supposed to look like do you have, are you sanguine about the possibility of these ideas infiltrating the schools in a, in a way that would fundamentally affect the schools? Or is, do you think 30 years from now there'll still be people coming to this kind of thing and it'll be at lunch and it'll be in the summer when it's a non-traditional program and it really won't infiltrate the schools very much? And, or maybe there's something completely different about the world now and I'm, so I guess I'm asking you to think about your crystal ball. Ooh, cool. <laughs> My crystal ball is purple, and if I look into it, um, I, I think so often uh, I'll take myself, I can be my own worst enemy because I went through a system that is going to be different than my son's, right? And I have expectations around, this is how I did it, I think he should do it the same way. And I think we need to challenge that, right? They're not growing up in the same world as us, we don't have to have a system that promotes one size fits all. And so I, I do think it can infiltrate, but I think it means that we need to rally together with administrators, teachers, parents, community, and say this is what we want. What, what is the point of schooling? What's the point of being literate, right? What, what is the goal? And Albemarle then had to go to their strategic plan and say here's the goal. We want our kids to be lifelong learners. We're in Virginia near the Appalachian Trail. We have a, we will, to be a complete disservice if we don't allow our kids to become lifelong learners, right? And so that's the mission that they set out. And I think if schools don't actually have conversations like that, then it stays status quo. And I think that's the real issue, is that we continue to have those conversations. And so that's why I gave you examples of those administrators that are saying, here's how we're trying to create change. I think we're at real risk with keeping things the same because that's the way it's always been done. In teacher prep, so often when, um, Educators came in, the pre-service teachers, they came in because they were good at school. They knew how to do well at the system. And we had to kind of chisel away at that and say, well, hang on a second, just because English was easy for you doesn't mean it's going to be easy for all 35 of your students. It might be easy for 31 of them, you know. But those other four, or maybe flip that, might be easy for four, but not for 31 of them. Right? And you had to chisel away at that. And so there's a way that I think we are in a system that, like, well, I, I went through education, I know about education, right? Everybody knows about education. And so we have to have those philosophical discussions about this, otherwise we just continue to do the same old stuff. So that is my purple, silver, uh, what was that? I'm sorry, crystal ball, crystal ball. Yeah, but great point. Yeah, are we just repeating history now in the 21st century John Dewey version? Yes. Here, I'll just use my outside voice. Okay, great, thanks, Sasha. Um, so I wanted to go back, actually back to the adult, the adult topic, um, because we do spend a lot of time talking about K-12, and I work at the Science Center, and one of our goals, and also challenges, is the engagement of people of all ages. 
um, not just K through 12. Because we're not a children's science center, we are a science center for everyone. Um, and I've had conversations about stem cells with kids, and I've had conversations with stem cells with adults, and with the same kind of outcome, like I have no idea. So my challenge, um, being one of the people who's been lucky enough to actually work in a maker space, um, and be a creative, and be a maker, um, has really been the engagement of adults. And so when you talk about like going to the maker fair and seeing this very just kind of like, I guess this self-centered like idea of like this is the thing that I'm making, um, I think that really helps to re-engage the adult um, in this idea of making. Because we had, and being the science center this year, I think we had 17 makers in the science center, um, which is a lot. You can put them all in one space and there's no space for anything else. But um, seeing someone turn, we had one guy there who's actually from Stone, and he turned what call, it's called the hot cake. So he turned old, um, kegs, old keg barrels, into, um, and he re kind of reinterpreted them into old style video games. And so they actually do that in Liberty Station, which is a place for adults to go. While they do take their children there, adults are going to want to go in and play video games, and then they say to themselves, oh, I could do this. And then they can potentially take that back to, you know, something that they could do with their families and re-engaging it that way. And that's been really my challenge, is re-engaging adults in a space um, like ours, the Tinkering Studio, and to re-engage them into the aspect of making. And I really think that's where the Maker Fair um, really kind of benefits the grown-up. Because we're the ones who have forgotten how to make. We're the ones who, you know, we have a nine to five job. We um, have bills to pay. Some of us have children. And it's like, I don't have time to do that stuff. But you do. And you have the time to do that. You could potentially do that as a family. You could do that with your kids. And so I think the Maker Fair really, whereas that's very selfish, you could do that. You could absolutely do that. You could quit your nine to five job, and that could be your job. And they are just lucky enough that they've been able to do that. And so it's not, it's definitely not self-centered at all. They just have the opportunity and the willpower to say, I am a maker, and this is what I make. So it's kind of, that's my perception on adults in making and making yeah. I, I And I find they're very, they're very open as well. Um, you know, to like discussing and helping. Uh, the other thing I was going to add is, uh, can you talk about the comics and the drinking? <laughs> sure. Yeah, because I think that will win over this crowd. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I actually, um, being an adult who makes and seeing the issues in in my studio. So I've been in the tinkering studio now, and now I oversee um, all of our permanent exhibits and traveling exhibits. But I started in the tinkering studio, and my biggest challenge was adults come in there and they come in with their kids, and they're like, "You go make," and then they're like on their phone, and I was like, "No, this is wrong." <laughs> Because I remember as a kid, my parents making with me, and like, I want to make this, cool, let's go to the store, let's get all the stuff, let's make this. And so I wanted to, I wanted to re-engage the adults with the Fleet Science Center in making, and we have tons of adult programs, but they're like, come to the Science Center, and they're all very science focused. So I created one that we launched this year that's called Maker Hour, which is a program where we go out to, if you won't come into the Tinkering Studio, we take the Tinkering Studio to a bar. So our first one, we made comic book coasters just after uh, Comic-Con. So, um, and they're feed programs, but you get to make something, you get to be in a community of other people who want to make the same thing, and you get to drink. <laughs> the last one we made was beer soap. So we took alcohol, we made soap with it, which is a great chemical reaction, and you get to drink. And you get to learn the science of soap and beer, because it's very chemistry-based. And then the next one we're going to do, and I have a sign up sheet, you can sign up for it to learn more about it, but we're going to make, um, small hydroponic farms with a, another local nonprofit who this is what they do. And you can make a small local, you know, small hydroponic farm in a bar and you can drink. And make friends because um, you, sign me up. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like with a glue gun with us, if you want to, after you've had a drink or two, you'll play with the glue gun. It's totally fine. <laughs> Be careful with the glue guns. <laughs> I, I have to admit with two children, five and under, um, I need a drink. <laughs> The other thing is if you haven't been outside to see the urban garden they have out there, that is phenomenal. Like there's no excuse to not have a garden, people. Like have you seen it? Go and see it. Hopefully they didn't lock the door. Take a friend with you and have one of them open up the door for you. Um, and go and see it. But I want to get back to your question. What's your name again? The librarian. Megan. Megan. Okay. Um, so the other advice, which I forgot to mention, is to go see other spaces. Go talk to other are there folks. Are there librarians or folks in here that have kind of gone through the same process of like we want to make... We're getting you know support from that. Anybody in the room that we can connect Megan with besides um, 
angel in the back. I did, a friend of mine runs a library at an independent study school, and it's a very quirky place. But they have a, a, an entire room which is dedicated to tinkering, like taking apart stuff, robotics, Legos, all that. So each, it has stations all over mm -hmm. the place. And for me, that's the dream. That's what I would prefer to do. We have, maybe in two years, we might be able to dedicate a space outside of the library. I'm very possessive of the library. It's the only calm, quiet place in the whole school. Totally. You know, so I, I, I'm trying to guard it as possessively as I can. So yes, I want a maker space. We do have a lot of maker spaces in the individual classrooms. I would like to have it, I would like to have it somewhere else. <laughs> but to make it so, but since I don't have any choice in the matter, I need to have some space in our library, and I would really like to figure out the best way to utilize that and still keep the library. It's yeah, to have both, right? Yeah. A calm space that a lot of kids and adults need. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let me know if you need, because I have like at least 10 people on my Rolodex of librarians that I can connect you with. Um, so I'm more than happy if you feel like you need more right. folks to talk to or visit. I mean, that, I think that's the number one thing that you heard from Gina Silvera as well. Like, she went and visited, went on field trips and saw spaces, right? Um, and then went to Maker Fair and saw things. I think that's the best way. Mm -hmm. Melissa Becker did that as well before she started hers. Do we have a question from Angel in the back I, and then over I on think, the right? I think we should go with one more. Oh, and he's so mean. I, I am. Uh, this, thought, this talk of food and drink got me thinking about <laughs> other opportunities this evening. Um, we'll take one more question. There'll be, times, there'll be time to pack up. And Jessica, I think, will be able to field some questions totally. there too. But you can so let's do Angel and then I'll make sure I talk to you, you folks as well. Okay. Hello. Uh, so you mentioned, uh, Homer mentioned about integration to schools. There are something that we did, and then maybe some suggestions from you. We started kind of like with our own program after school, during winter breaks, summer breaks, and then we started reaching, but sometimes we didn't have students coming back or something we were used for, just for the summer. So it was not kind of like, you couldn't keep track of the advancement. So we started reaching schools. So now we have kind of like an after school program in the school where we're, we're also working with teachers. So it's, it's depend, if they're teaching, I don't know, pulling and pushing forces during the month of October, we create an activity in which we do a making project. It could be a weekly project, a day project, a monthly project. And we do the activity focusing on what they're learning that week. Therefore, all of the weight was involving the shoulder of the teacher. We're kind of like collaborating. And I don't know, do you have any suggestions on how to improve the collaboration with the uh, teacher at the local school? Uh, how to integrate the system better? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, mostly, why we want to add the integration is to keep track of the advancement or how students are mm, they're applying the skills we are teaching them. And then something I would like to add to the collaboration comment that we that I heard before the making making fair is that uh, we are in a society in which we think we can do everything on our own. So if you want to collaborate, you have to reach other uh, other uh, other companies, other for other uh, corporations, other uh, business who are doing something similar. Because I don't know, I feel like in the making space. It's universal. It's engineering, it's math, creativity, and it's also separated by any barriers like language, social status, money. As you mentioned, you can use a uh, 3D printer, or you can use paper and glue. It's just an open space, and it's universal. And it's, I mean, everyone can collaborate, but you have to reach them. Because that's what we did. We reached the school we wanted to collaborate, but we had to do it on our own and extend our hands and talk to them. And then, my other question was, do you have any situations on how to make the collaboration better? Yeah, so that was a lot. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I actually want to turn it over to you guys. Do you have ex examples, ideas for how to make collaboration with teachers um, stronger, better? And, and then I think um, the one thing I would also suggest, and I think you're already doing it, is but to document those, the, the learning and the skills that's happening. I've seen great stuff done where kids can actually do their own kind of history and look at their growth over time kind of do a timeline or their own biography based on, you know, charting out, oh, I came in and I didn't know how to do this, and now I know how to code, and I, I only knew how to do this on Scratch, and now I knew how to do this, to give them the opportunity to document that, so then you can share it with parents, guardians, etc. 
So I'm sure you're already doing that in some way, but that is a wonderful idea so they can actually see their own growth, and, you, and that helps you then say, look at the learning that's happening, give us more money type thing, because that's always important. Yes, add on to collaboration yeah, between so educators. Um, we're, we have a STEM ecosystem, so we're trying to connect all of the efforts and maker and, and other aspects of STEM together. But like, we just need you guys to like come shit, like let us know what you're doing. Because for me, I don't really know. I didn't know all this was happening. I didn't know you guys need collaboration. I didn't know you need to contact the teachers. And we have superintendents involved. We have teachers like connecting. And so, if you guys are interested, um, please reach out to me because we need you. We want all of you, and we just want to connect you all and have that collaboration happen. We have corporations and. Everyone kind of in STEM in San Diego and Boston. Come to me, please. <laughs> or welcome to you, too. So, again, I'd like to thank Jessica for a lovely presentation. Again, I'd also like to thank all the exhibitors who came and helped us out tonight and shared your ideas. Um, the, this notion of education, equity, economics. Uh, lovely way to merge them all in and outside of STEM tonight. And um, if you would be so kind on your way out to do two things, if you could help us with the dishes and pick them up, and feel free to take cookies to go until they're gone. And again, thank you for coming. Um, part of making is cleaning up, so yes, that's important. And one last thing, I would challenge folks in the room to actually start a San Diego Maker Meetup. Like once every Thursday, you know, a Thursday a month, from six to eight, have a meetup, continue to connect because these great discussions don't have to stop here, right? You guys have a wonderful community, wealth of knowledge.